than that, the topic of God. So we're going to explore, not explain, because we only have a half an hour, but we're going to explore the topic of the God of the Bible. That is to say, the Judeo-Christian concept of God. And that's the God who is shown to us in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. It's hard to know where to begin with this topic because God is the largest idea that we can conceive of. When I think about explaining God to people, I remember the story about the little girl in the Sunday school class who was furiously drawing away with a crayon. And the teacher was amazed to see her scribbling away, going at it so intensely. And she asked the little girl, she said, sweetheart, what are you doing? And the little girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but honey, nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl said, well, they will when I'm done. <laughs> so no one can launch an investigation to know what God looks like, but God has done us a favor. He has already drawn a picture of himself for us in the scriptures, in the Bible. And there are 12 things that we want to look at about God tonight, and I'm going to go through them very quickly. Since I've only got 30 minutes or so, we can only take a peek at the drawing that God has made of himself in the scripture. But I hope that this fresh look at God will get you thinking. So let's talk quickly about 12 things you need to know about God. The first thing is that he is eternal. God is eternal. To say that God is eternal is one of the most perplexing things that we can say about anything. Even if you believe that you will live forever, you know that you had a beginning. You're only eternal in one direction. But when we say that God is eternal, we mean that he has no beginning and he has no end. There never was a time when God did not exist and there will never be a future in the a time in the future when he will not exist. In the Bible, God calls himself I am. He doesn't call himself I was or I'm going to be. For God, it's always now. He's the I am. The Bible tells us in Psalm 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth in the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. As Christians, we believe that God stands outside of time and space, that he actually created time and space. So the concept that we have of God in the Bible, in Judaism and in Christianity, is that God has always existed. He is uncreated. Nobody made God. Before God, there was nothing. And he will exist forever in a state of perfection. He will never grow weak, grow tired, or grow old. He's the ever-living one. He never changes, and he cannot be changed. He will always be the same as he is now. If that doesn't blow your mind, stay tuned. Uh, second, God is a spirit. He is a spirit. He is not a corporeal being, which means he does not have a body like you and I have. We cannot make an image of God. And of course, many of you will remember in the Ten Commandments, you've seen the movie, right? You've seen, how many of you have seen the Ten Commandments? Moses and the Hebrew slaves must not be allowed to leave Egypt, right? <laughs> you remember that. In the Ten Commandments, the people of Israel were commanded by Moses never to make an image of God. See, God is so much higher and greater than what we can possibly imagine. If we could imagine him, he wouldn't be God. We cannot make a portrait of God that can ever do him justice. We cannot make a temple for him, the scripture says, that can possibly contain him. God says to us in the book of Isaiah, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me and where is the place of my rest? You cannot contain God. Jesus said God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus was teaching us that real worship comes from the heart, and it isn't about special holy places, and it isn't about childishly imagining God to look a certain way. You know, you've all seen paintings of God. He's, he's an Italian grandfather. He sits on a fluffy cloud, right? You've all seen that. Now, there are times, of course, that we do speak of God in human terms, but we should not take away from that the idea that God is like you and me. 
we speak of the hand of the Lord or the eyes of the Lord, things like that. But that's really just a way of speaking that helps us to understand the activity of God. It helps us to understand what God is doing. So when the Bible tells us to find shelter under God's wings, it doesn't mean that God is a giant bird or that he looks like a giant angel with wings. That type of language is just used to express a truth about God and about what God does in ways that human beings can relate to. Third thing about God we need to check into is that God is a person. It's important to know that when we say God is a spirit, we are not trying to say that God is a force or that he is an energy like electricity is or gravity. He is not a neutral force like the force in Star Wars that can be good or bad, depending. You know, in Star Wars, the force can be manipulated, right, for good or evil. And there is a dark side and there is a light side. But the God of the Bible is not the force. He's not just an energy. Neither is he an influence or a power in the atmosphere. He's a real person. In biblical terms, we think of a person as someone who has an intellect, somebody who has a will of their own, a mind of their own, and can express emotions, somebody who has the capacity to reason. I'm a dog lover, and I've even been learning lately to like cats, but I have to admit to you that uh, you and I can encounter the world intellectually, right, in a way that my dog can never do. I just lost half the room because, you know... <laughs> The dog people will be mad at me. But we are special persons in a way that dogs are not. If I see my dog texting, then I might change my mind. <laughs> so the Bible says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. God has a mind. He's alive. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? He's not merely a force, but he's a person with the most incredible intellect, with his own will, and he has intensely passionate emotions. Maybe it's difficult for us to associate those kinds of things with somebody that doesn't have a body as we understand it. But God thinks and he reasons. He communicates and he speaks and he feels and he can take pleasure in things. And God has known friendship and love and even disappointment. He's a person. Number four, God is omniscient. That's a big mouthful. God is omniscient. Theology is the study of God. And when we say God is omniscient, this is a fancy theological way of saying that God is all-knowing. God knows everything. Have you ever known somebody who was a real know-it-all? Well, God literally is a know-it-all. He knows everything that there is to be known. He has all knowledge. He knows everything that happens, and he knows everything that has ever happened. He can even do what you're glad your wife can't do, which is read your mind. <laughs> you can't fool God, and you can't sneak up on God. Don't ever play against him on Jeopardy, because he wins every time. He doesn't forget anything, and he doesn't ever have a senior moment. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So when something unexpected happens, God never says, oh my me. He never says, I didn't know that was going to happen. No one ever has to inform God about anything. And listen, when God asks you a question, he is not looking for information. He already knows the answer. God has all wisdom. He not only has all knowledge, but he also has the wisdom to put everything together perfectly. Number five, God is also omnipresent. When we say God is omnipresent, we're saying that God is everywhere. He's consciously aware of everything that's taking place in the universe and whatever might be beyond the universe. He's able to be anywhere, and in fact, he is everywhere all at once. How is this possible? I have no idea. But he is able to manifest his presence anywhere. King David wrote in Psalm 139, beautiful poetic words, he said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. 
If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now, God is everywhere, but that doesn't mean that God is everything. Are you with me? See, some religions believe that God is in everything or that God actually is everything. They would say that everything is made out of God. You know, the tree is God, the rock is God, uh, you're God, your chair is God, I'm God. Listen, I would suggest to you tonight that if you and I are God, we are doing a bad job. But Jews and Christians have never believed this theory. The Bible doesn't teach that. God is everywhere, but God is not the same thing as the things that are around us. He stands apart and he is separate from the things that he has made. Number six, God is omnipotent. Saying God is omnipotent means he's all powerful. He can do anything and there's nothing that he cannot do. Sometimes people say things like, well, if God is all-powerful, could he make a rock that was so heavy that he couldn't lift it? I like to say, yes, he could, and then he would lift it anyway. <laughs> God's power is limitless, and he made the heavens simply by speaking them into existence as a sheer act of his will. The Bible says that for God, nothing is impossible. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, with God, nothing and it literally means there in, in the original Greek that the Gospels were written in, it says nothing that God says will be impossible for him to do. I like that. Number seven, tonight God is sovereign. God is sovereign. This is one that we don't think of very often, but it's actually very important. It means that God's will is completely unfettered or unhindered. It, it does mean, in a sense, that God is the highest authority that exists. He's the king of everything, if you like. God rules over any being that exists, and everything that lives is accountable to him and has to answer to him. But it means a lot more than that. It means that God, when we say God is sovereign, it means that God is the only person who is completely capable of doing whatever he wants to do. Ultimately, he answers to no one. The Bible says in Psalm 135, For I know that the Lord is great. <laughs> I, I didn't tell him to do that. He just, he just did it. And our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. See, God is the only person who is completely free to do what he wishes. And there is no one who has the right to oppose him or to interfere in his activities unless God gives permission. God cannot be limited in any way without his consent. No one has the authority or the ability to challenge God's actions. He's completely free and sovereign. Number eight, God is the creator. He's the creator. As Christians, we believe that God is the maker of everything. We're going to talk about creation, and we're going to talk about the creation of man on another evening, a few weeks down the road. But we believe that God made the heavens and the earth and everything that's in them, from the stars to the atoms that they're made out of. God has no cause, but he caused everything. The philosophers would say that God is the first cause. He is the prime cause mover. If you trace everything back to its beginning, you'll find not blind chance, but you will find a purposeful mind. Again, God is not a part of his creation, but he stands apart from it. God fashioned everything with knowledge and wisdom. And so we are not the result of cosmic accidents. We are not the result of random collisions of subatomic particles. In heaven, they praise God saying this, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they exist and they were created. 
You know, there was no cosmic egg which hatched and gave birth to the universe, as some religions say, nor is there an endless cycle of birth and rebirth, as some religions assert. The Bible teaches us that God made everything out of nothing. Creation had a definite beginning according to the plan of God, and this is important because God made the universe. The uni universe is not meaningless. Both the universe and our lives have a definite purpose and a definite goal which God intended. God was personally active in doing all these things, and he did them with a deliberate plan and a deliberate purpose. So it's important for you to know tonight that you are not the end product of billions of years of stardust banging around in space accidentally. You are the craftsmanship of a wise and a loving designer. David said in Psalm 139, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Number nine tonight, God is holy. He is holy. Holiness is a word that we don't hear much in the modern world, and the idea of holiness gets a bad rap, but it's important for us to know that God is holy. Now, that means a couple of things in the Bible. First, it means that God is set apart from his creation. God is unique. God is special. He's different from us, and there's nobody like him. He's in a category all by himself. Second, and this is the way we use the word more usually, to say God is holy means that God is pure. He is morally pure and perfect. God cannot do evil, and he cannot be tempted to do anything that is evil. Everything that God does is righteous, meaning that it's completely fair and just. God's character is noble. He is selfless and he is spotless. When we see God, no one, not one of us, will be able to accuse him of doing anything that is wrong or improper in any way. The Bible says to him, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and you cannot look on wickedness. And, you know, we find when we read the Bible that when people encountered God or Jesus, they became fearful because their conscience would accuse them. In the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, Adam, we read the first man, he sinned against God. And when he did so, he ran away from God and became afraid when he heard God's voice. In the New Testament, Peter, the apostle, had the same reaction to Jesus. When he saw Jesus' power displayed, he said to Jesus, Lord, depart from me because I am a sinful man. And that brings me naturally to number 10, which is that God desires relationship with human beings. He desires relationship with human beings. The Bible shows us that God desires the companionship of people, even in our messed up condition, which is afraid of God. We were made in his image, which means a lot of different things. But one thing it certainly does mean is that we have the ability to communicate with God and we have the ability to relate to God. Why should he be interested in this at all? You know, if you can make galaxies, are people even interested? To me, that's one of the most remarkable things about God, that he would actually be interested in us and pastor jason was leading us in a song that talked about that tonight you know who am i that you are mindful of me the bible tells us that we are in fact interesting to him so much so that he would want to have a friendship with us and even a father child relationship with the human beings he's made he says in the bible i will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters says the lord almighty that leads me to number 11, and we're in the home stretch here. God has revealed himself to humanity. He has spoken to us. Somebody put it this way, God is there and he is not silent. God has spoken to us from the earliest days of history. As time went on, he revealed more and more of himself. He revealed more and more about himself. As Christians, we believe that God basically has revealed himself to us in three different ways. 
First, God has revealed himself to us in creation, in the things that are made. Creation reveals to us the existence of God. The Bible tells us that we are responsible, every person is responsible to know that there is a creator. In other words, we should be able to tell from looking at nature that somebody created it. We can see from the beauty and the order that is there in nature that there is a God. Now, creation doesn't tell you how to know God, but it does tell you that there is one, that he is somebody who is other than us and that he is powerful. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. When you see pictures from the Hubble telescope, when you see the Grand Canyon and all these things, that feeling of wonder inside of you is designed to make you realize somebody greater than I am made these things. Second, God has spoken to us through the Bible. The Bible reveals to us the nature of God. He not only speaks through creation, but the Bible, which we often, you often hear us refer to as the word of God. It's his message. Think of how great you are as a human being compared to an ant or compared to an amoeba. I don't mean to insult anybody tonight, but the gap between God and his creatures is even greater than that. And even though God wants to reveal himself to us, God is so much higher than us than that all we can know about God is what God chooses to tell us about himself. Let, let me say that again because that, that may be something that maybe not everybody has thought about before. God is so much greater than us and we can't investigate him scientifically that all we can ever know about God is what God decides to tell us about himself. That's why God needed to reveal himself to us at a deeper level than just us looking at what he's made. We're going to have a lot more to say about this next week when we talk about the Bible and what it is. But for now, let me just say that the Bible is God speaking to us through other people whom he chose to give his messages. Down through history, God spoke to people about himself and about how to live. Those writings were preserved for us as the Bible. Jews and Christians believe that the Bible is the word of God. It is a revelation from God in which God has told us what he wants us to know about a variety of different topics, including himself. Third, Christians believe that God has revealed himself to us through Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ reveals God to us in a unique way. As Christians, we believe that God's most unique and greatest revelation to us was Jesus Christ. We believe that God decided to become a man in the person of Jesus. And so now we could not only read about what God is like, but we could actually encounter him in life. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. See, Jesus represented God to us in a way that no mere words could ever do, no matter how wonderful or special those words might be. He was God in the flesh. Jesus said to his followers, he said, if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. Jesus showed us in a unique way the heart of God, God's compassion, and God's love. And that brings me to number 12, that God is love. Not only does God have love or possess love, not only is God very loving, but he actually is love. If I could say it this way, it's who and what he is. It's the essence. Love is the essence of God's nature and the essence of God's character. It means that God is good. He's benevolent. That means that God wishes good. He wishes people well and not harm. You know, at Christmas, we read about how God sent his angels to announce that God wants friendship with us and that he wants good things for us. The God of the Bible is not like the gods of other religions who are distant, who are unknowable, or even as one religion calls their God, the greatest of all deceivers. 
God is not uncaring about our situation. And so he had his Christmas angels say, who knows, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. That's God's desire toward us. God is motivated by selfless love, which thinks about the good of others, namely you. He wants the best for you, and the Bible says that he wants everything in your life to work together for good. That doesn't mean that I will understand all the twists and turns of my life, but it does mean that he genuinely loves me and cares about me and wants me to be happy. To that end, to that purpose, the Christian faith claims an amazing thing, that the God who made the universe actually loved us so much that he became one of us so that he could remove the barriers between God and people. We hope that over the next few weeks, if you haven't already done so, you'll come to know this God in a personal way and experience that love as, as I think many people in this room have done. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, just as I close and just before we go into a time of group discussion, maybe you'd like to pray a simple prayer with us tonight. You don't have to, but it's just a simple prayer telling God that you want to know him better. You don't have to pray if you don't want to, but maybe there are some people here who want to know that God better and know that love. And if you'd like to pray, if that's you, then I want to ask everybody just for the sake of those who may want to pray, if you wouldn't mind just closing your eyes just for a second tonight. And as I pray, you can just pray along with me silently if you like. Again, no pressure. This is just for anyone who may just want to pray. Dear God, I don't understand it all. But if you're real, I want you to begin to reveal yourself to me. I want you to show me your love and your goodness. Amen. Just before our group discussion time, I want to invite you to come back and be with us next Wednesday as we take a fresh look at the Bible. We're going to be giving out Bibles to you, to anybody who maybe you don't have a Bible and you'd like to own a Bible, and we'll have an interesting look at the Bible together. So let's move into our uh, group discussions now, and I want to thank everybody again for, for coming tonight and for helping out, and uh, just enjoy the rest of your evening.